please bow your head with me and let us pray. It is amazing that we can only close our eyes or focus our brains on you and say, our Lord and our Father, and we've got a God that listens to us. Sadly, we do not always realize the profoundness of this moment. For humans to be able to speak to the Creator God, the all-powerful one, the magnificent one, and have your attention where you are actively listening to what we are saying. We would like to thank you, worship you, and praise your name for this wonderful privilege. We want to acknowledge that you are God and that we are just human. We want to acknowledge that it's grace, only grace, that gives us this opening, this connection to you and with you. Thank you for being such an amazing God that tolerate us, that have so much patience for us. We do not act like people that understand prayer. We do not act like people that understand what it means to have a God. And we are sorry for this, Lord, because many times we are so distracted by the world and all the things around us that your image fades a little bit. But on Sundays, we are reminded of who you are. And thank you by being here with us and to remind us that you are with us. You're calling for us and your plan for us. Please, this morning, speak to us through your word that we might discover in these words also the comfort, the strength, and then also the commands that we need to receive from you. On this day. In your name we ask this. Amen. So, so Louise was driving home on Tuesday evening and she was listening to this program where it was on the radio, Friends Talking Faith. Now, I do not know if anyone have heard this program. It's on NPR. It's a, a, are you hot? I see some people are doing this. Richard, turn on one of the ACs, please. I think everything is off. I do not know. <laughs> hey, Richard said he's got, got an AC on. Richard, you're the man. Right. Uh, so, so on this radio program, Friends Talking Face, you've got, a, you've got a, a, a imam, a Muslim imam, you've got a Jewish rabbi, and then you've got a reverend, a Christian, that now talks about faith issues. On Tuesday evening, they had three children. Um, two were 11, one was 13. And they asked them, asked them religious questions. And Louise said to me what she heard, and it was really disturbing to me. So I found the uh, podcast, and I listened to it because I want to make sure I tell you what actually happened there because I had to listen to the whole thing. So they asked the little Muslim child who was there, so if anybody would ask you what do you think or, or what do you believe, what makes you a Muslim? The Muslim kid answered and he said, well, that God is great and God is the only one that needs to be worshipped and that we need to pray, pray and do good things. They asked the Jewish boy, Matthew, they asked him, so what does it mean to be a Jew? And his answer was that, well, if you're a Jew, then you need to follow the com commands of the Lord. And then he started to talk about bar mitzvah. He said, and then when I'm 13 or 15, whatever, then I can be an adult and I can be a part of the Jewish community. Knew exactly where he was going and who he was. Asked the little Christian person, what does it mean to be a Christian? I really listened to it because I couldn't believe it. His answer was, to be a Christian means that there are fables. There are stories and there are legends in the Bible that helps us to know how to live. Now, I haven't read these two books, but it seems to me there's an idiot guide out there to help us, you and me, understand what Christianity is all about. Now, I've always wondered, why would you have two books, Christianity and then Evangelical Christianity? Aren't all Christians supposed to be evangelical? Because evangelical means to bring the gospel, the story of Christ out to the world out there. 
So I was asking myself the question, if anybody would ask you or me, what does it mean to be a Christian, can't we answer that question? Now, there are many places in the Bible that gives a very short synopsis of what it means to be a Christian. But in Revelation chapter 14, you find one of the most amazing answers that you and I can always quote or read if you want to. And read for yourself to understand what it means to be a Christian. Let's read this. Then I saw another angel flying in mid-heaven with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on earth. To every nation, tribe, language, and people, he said in a loud voice, Fear God, give Him glory, for the hour of His judgment has come. Worship Him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. Then another angel, a second, followed, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon, the great shares made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Then another angel, a third, followed them, crying with a loud voice, Those who worship the beast and its image and receive a mark on their foreheads and on their hands, they will also drink the wine of God's wrath, poured unmixed into the cup of His anger, and they will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And let me explain. We have got three angels. The last few weeks I talked to you about the unholy trinity. Oh, that, that really difficult piece in Revelation chapter 12 and 13 that introduced us to Satan. Satan standing on the beach. Satan that's really trying his best to destroy everything that's good and godly and churchy. Then we find the Antichrist, the one that opposes Jesus and what Jesus came to do for us. To bring a gospel that is not the gospel of Jesus. And the, one, the best tool in the hand of the Antichrist is the false prophet that tells the lie about the Bible and the church and about who Christ is. If you read all of this, it sort of gets depressing, isn't it? I said, Luis, I didn't really enjoy the previous sermons I preached up until today because it's dark, it's somber, it's just all the attack on the church and all the bad things that's coming, bad things that are coming our way. But then Revelation chapter 14, three angels. Satan sends his best, himself, the Antichrist, the false prophet, and God sends three angels to declare what's going to happen. So, okay, Satan, that's now your plan to destroy my church and my kingdom, but what is happening and going to happen is, and then you discover the message of these three angels. And the first one says, the eternal gospel. The eternal gospel. And that brings me back to my introduction. So what is the gospel? The gospel is God's connection with human or with humanity. The gospel has to do with the fact that God from the beginning of mankind wanted to touch us and to make us a part of who He is. The gospel has to do with God connecting with people still in 2016. The gospel has to do with the fact that God through the ages always showed himself for the God that he is. In Genesis, you discover a God of the covenant, a God that made a covenant with Adam and Eve, a God that made a covenant with Abraham. In Genesis chapter 17. In Exodus, you discover a God that saves, a God that brought his people out of Egypt and he took them to the promised land to show himself not only to the Israelites but to the world that they would know who he is. Leviticus, you find a God that says, because you belong to me, I want you to be different. I want you to act like people that belong to the only holy God there is. In Deuteronomy, you find this God leading people still further and bringing them to the land where they need to be and say, this is what I would like you to have, my presence in a beautiful, great place. In Numbers, we see how the people expand and how they grow in their numbers. In Judges, we discover, we discover God that brings to His people leaders that will help them understand who this God is and what this God wants. Then we, we discover Israel, Nehemiah, and all the other things as it went through. They'll, I don't want to go through all of this. But here you find a timeline of, of, of the whole complete biblical story. And constantly in every one of these books, you discover a God that's involved in the lives of people. In a very human way, God comes and He speaks and He touches. And he directs, and he drags, and he pulls people to understand one thing. He's God. They are not alone. And this book has been written, the Bible was written by 
hundreds of different people over thousands of years and constantly the same story, a God that's involved in a life, in the lives of humanity. But what you and I will find is that from the beginning there were people trying to stop this God from doing His work. There were people trying to stop this gospel to continue. And a few examples that you will find. The first one is King Joachim. Isaiah came to him, sorry, Ezekiel came to him and he said, the Lord wanted me to, uh, to, to, to tell you what he wants. And he was sitting at his fireplace. And as he was reading, he was cutting off the pieces of Bible that Jeremiah brought and he threw it in the fire. You'll find this in Jeremiah chapter 38. And he burned up the whole, the whole Bible, the whole book that God brought to him. And God said to Jeremiah, just write a different one. In the time of Antiochus Epiphanes, this was just um, 200 years or so before Christ was born, he said, if anybody is caught with the law of God in his hand, he will be killed. He said, there will be no Bible, no law, no nothing of God in this territory of ours. He did not do that well. Diocletianus, or Diocletian, he said there will be no Bible in the Roman Empire. If anybody has anything to do with the Old Testament, he or she, and remember now the New Testament scriptures were already available at this point. He said, if anybody is caught with anything Christian, they will be killed. Years 320 after his death, Constantine became the emperor of Rome and he declared the Bible as the official book of the Roman Empire. You'll find a guy uh, with the name Jerome. Jerome in 405 AD was the first guy that translated the Bible from Greek and Hebrew into Latin because he wanted the people actually to be able to read the Bible and understand the gospel. But remember now, this is very important. At this point, the Roman Catholic Church and the Roman government are exactly the same thing. And the Roman government did not want the people to read the Bible because they knew if the people would read the Bible, they would discover that what they made with the Roman Catholic Church is not the church anymore. We need to keep the church we need to keep the Bible away from the people. So Jerome was persecuted. He was banned. He couldn't do his work anymore because they wanted to stop this new Bible for in Latin that people could read to reach the people. John Wycliffe in England said, I want everybody to be able to read the Bible in English. And he started to try and translate the Bible into English. And let me read what they said about him. John Wycliffe was said, the following was said about him. Um, that pestilent wrench, John Wycliffe, the son of the old serpent, that's Satan himself, forerunner of the Antichrist who has completed this inequity by inventing a new translation of the Scriptures. Of course, it made it possible for people to read the Bible in English. He was burned at the stake. He was burned. And the people that they caught with a translation of the New Testament or the Old Testament in English, they tied it around their necks and they burnt all of them. Then you get William Tyndale. After the printing press was first time, first time designed, he said, okay, now I'm going to print Bibles like heck because the printing press is now available. And he started to print Bibles. The church got together and they burnt thousands and thousands of copies of the Bible because they said, we can't have this book in the hands of people. And they burnt William Tyndale at the stake. He was also burned. In 1758, between that year, South Korea decided that they, and I'm just one example, I'm not even talking about Russia and other places at some point that banned the Bible, but South Korea during that period said, there will not be a Bible in this country ever. At this point, South Korea is sending out more missionaries into this world than any other country in the world. A guy went to an American hospital in Turkey, and somebody gave him a Bible. He went back to his town in Turkey, and he showed it to the imam, and the imam said, you can't have this book here. And he tore out all the pages, and he threw it in the street, and this guy was so afraid, he just walked away. But the pages were flying around, or were, were drifting around in the street. And there was a baker, and he saw all these pages, and he said, well, I'm going to get all of this. And he started wrapping baked goods in these sheets of paper. And within a month, almost everybody in town had a piece of the Bible because the bread came in pieces of, of the Bible. And they came to the baker and said, where did you get this? Because we want to continue to read the story. 
And many years later, when the Bible actually found its way into Turkey through many way means, the people were so hungry for the word. Then you get this guy, John, uh, uh, not John, uh, uh, Voltaire, who actually said, another century and there will not be a Bible on earth. What he does not know is that the place that he was born in, in France, actually then became later, many years after his death, like 400 years after his death, 300 years, became a place where there was a printing press for Bibles in France. By poor coincidence, but I believe a coincidence is only miracles where God wants to stay anonymous. Last week, last week in America, this is a missing table display at a veterans hospital to remember the uh, POWs. Uh, to remember the people that were, were killed in action. This table was set up as a short, small memorial to remind people of what some of our people went through in the armed forces in sacrificing themselves for our country and what helped them to get through it. And they placed a Bible, that's a Bible, on the table. And the Military Religious Freedom Foundation came and they complained I get so upset, I'm throwing stuff around now. The Military Religious Freedom Foundation came and they complained about the Bible on this table. They said, the Christians complained about it. The guy who organized the display was forced to remove the Bible. Last week in America. So if this angel flies, and this angel proclaims the eternal gospel to, gospel to every nation, every tribe, all the people of the world. It is God at work, and nobody can stop the work of God. No one, not Satan, not the Antichrist, not the false prophet. Because there's an eternal need in the hearts of people. And God doesn't care for the rest. God cares for people. God knows that people say, I'm not a Christian because I'm strong and I have it together. I'm a Christian because I'm weak and I admit I need a Savior. That's the need of people. People are broken and they know eventually, if they are honest with themselves, I can't make it without having God in my life. And the eternal gospel has always been God coming down to us and say, you have lost me, but I'm not gone. You are the one that walked away and I am there. I'm here. And even though this world will try its best to prevent God from doing his work, nothing and no one can stop him. Because the answer is timeless. Timeless. These are two Bugattis. But they are sort of different, I think, a little bit. The Bugatti there at the back is like a million plus dollars. The one in the front is probably also a million plus now. <laughs> Not when you bought it. But these things are completely different in the sense uh, now they look and what's underneath the bonnet, you know, the hood, the engine, whatever. But in a, in a sense, still the same. It's a car that needs wheels to go somewhere. And if you drive these things, you need to abide, obey the rules of the road and stop at street lights and at stop streets and, and need to be careful of dump trucks and buses that can hit you and take you out. If you are in that car or this car, I promise you a dump truck will take you out if you drive across a red light. You've got no chance. The gospel is timeless. So people that come with this argument and say, well, it's not for our time are completely stupid. Because the answers are still the same that people need. We may dress differently. We may act differently. We may have all the technology around us. But in the core of the hearts of people, they are still lost in need of God. And therefore, this gospel will not be able to be stopped by anyone until just before the second coming of Christ. The second thing that, that it says is, fear God and give Him glory. The fear of God is a reverent awe. It's a holy sense of divine wow. You see, the moment when you understand the gospel, the gospel means that God says, hey, I'm here. I, I, I care for you. And you look up and you see this God and something happens in your heart. You get a fear for God, but not a fear like you're afraid and you run away like Adam and Eve. But you've got this awe for this God that actually cares for you. 
This God that actually loves you. This God that actually wants to help you. This God that is so mighty and big that he could walk away from you, but he does exactly the opposite. He says, I'm here for you, even though you do not deserve it. And the fear for God means to allow this God to be God in your life. This fear of God means to allow God as the God of this universe to be the God that he is. This sounds weird, isn't it? For me to allow God to be God. Isn't he God? He is God. But I can live as if he is not God in my life. It's like a child that walks away from his parents. They are his parents. They do care for him. They do want to help him. But he ignores them. By just returning home and saying, you are my dad, you are my mom, he actually acknowledges their position in his life. The awe, the fear of God is walking back to God and saying, you are God, but I realize you are my God. You're also the one that made, it, that made me. Then we need to give him glory. Why is this so important that it's even in this book of Revelation so many times? Being, giving glory to God means that you, that you acknowledge that what you have comes from God and, and, and nowhere else. Giving glory to God make, make, makes you understand that I'm not king of my castle, but God is. That I don't own what I have, that it's a gift by God, that what I receive and what I do and can do is a gift from God, that God is everything and I'm nothing. When you walk outside, you see a beautiful day. Thank you, Lord, you have given me this great day. Thank you for my family. Thank you for my money. Thank you for my health. Thank you for my friends. Thank you for everything that I've got. It all comes from God, and giving glory to God means exactly that. It's yours that I have as a gift. But the angel says another thing, for the hour of judgment has come. Now, this is where things get bad for the church. This is where people start to leave. Sadly, we live in a time where people do not want to hear anything about God's judgment. The new modern church is like this one. The first service will be today, 2016 in Lafayette. Lafayetteville, sorry. At 4 p.m. this afternoon, pray for this church. The preachings will not focus on devils, hell, or sin. And instead will focus on Jesus and the love of God, this pastor Gibbons says. People, I have good news and I have bad news. The, the good news is that um, we are all sinners. No, no, it's wrong. The bad news is we are all sinners. <laughs> the good news is Jesus died for us on the cross. How are you going to change this? How can you have a church that doesn't preach about sin and about judgment? And that's the problem. We live in an era, we live in a time in our culture where people never want to hear that they've done anything wrong. Don't tell me what to do. Don't judge me. I don't want to be judged by anyone because I am the king and I am the God of my own world. And time and time again, when a pastor preaches a sermon that has to do with judgment, with the fact that the God is also a God of wrath, even though he's a God of love and all these things, he's a righteous God that will punish sin. People say, oh no, I need to leave. I need to find a church where I feel always great when I leave. It's like a movie. Most people only want to go to movies so that when they leave the movie, they've got this good feeling in their hearts. You don't need to worry about the ending because it's always going to end well. You need to do yourself a favor. Watch some foreign movies. This stuff made in, in especially in the Netherlands and in France. And if you could, you need to watch some South African movies. My kids don't want to watch them anymore. Because you have no idea well, how it's going to end, and most it ends in such a way it drips your gut out. It never ends well. The movie seldom ends well because life does not always end well for everybody. When I came to America, I said to this is the most amazing place to go to a movie. I can relax the whole time. I don't care. The, the good guy is always going to be good at the end, and he's never going to be killed. Man, bullets can fly, but he's always cool. 
This is not life. Not the life within the church. There are people that's going to get lost and be lost because they do not believe. God will punish them. God will. Lastly, worship Him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. Why would the angels say this? Why now this? Because that's everything. That's everything. Worship the one who made the heaven, who made the earth, and that made the water. Because without water, we won't be here. We can create and make lots of stuff, but we can't really make water. Or we can't make the heaven, we can't make the earth. I told you before, this guy that came to God, and he said, I can do all the things that you have made. He stood there with a rock, and God said, no, go and find your own rock. You can't use my rock to do what, what you want to do. It's mine. I made everything. Go and find your own stuff. To remind us that what we have comes from God and He made it. And what they have done in schools is they've removed the Bible. They have removed the Bible and the truth that God has created. And they come up with this nonsense of evolution. And now the kids have no clue anymore who God is. I, I said to Louise yesterday, we were talking about something, and I said to her, there's one thing about evolution I've never got an answer. So there is now time, and there is now matter, and then there's chance, and now the slimy thing starts to live. And the slimy thing crawls out of this mud pool, and the slimy thing now makes it outside. That's really horrible and dangerous, but the slimy thing makes it. Now maybe another slimy thing crawls out, and another slimy thing is there. When do they now develop different sexualities? How did that happen that these two sliming things there are? And one is now male and one is now female? Or did that just happen because they knew that if something didn't happen, they would die? But wouldn't they just die? There are so many unanswered questions in evolution, but they remove God completely from the equation and say, well, it's all just an accident and just time and matter made this possible. The Bible comes and teaches us this, but one. But one. Then it says, worship him, and this is my second last slide. Older picture, you will recognize some people that aren't here anymore. God wants us to worship him. Not only by ourselves at home, but in a place like this. God wants us to be connected not only with him, but with one another. You can't do it by yourself. You can't. And years ago, as a student, I had a friend who also wanted to become a pastor, and it was really hard in the beginning. At some point, he said he maybe he should study something different, and at some point, he didn't go to church anymore. And he was really a great guy. He lived at the same, on the same property where I stayed. Then after five, six months, his whole life started to change. But I still saw him at night read his Bible when I walked past his room. And I know he's a Christian, but his whole life started to change. And one day, I said to him, What's, what's going on with you? Because a few things happened that was sort of weird in his life. He said, what do you mean? I said, I said, you are different than you were before. He said, no, no, don't worry. His life started to fall apart, and I would say it was mainly because he didn't go to church anymore. He tried to read the Bible by himself. He tried to do this thing by himself. But God knows you can't do it by yourself because you sometimes need someone to say to you, no. You sometimes need someone else to say to you, you can't do this. You need someone to say to you, don't forget God and how holy he is and how, how awesome he is. Otherwise, I just read and I say, okay, this is not for me. That's for the guy next to me. And I go through the passages that I like and I just disregard the others. You and I need to be connected to each other to know that we are not alone in this world that wants to kill the gospel. But this world can't kill the gospel, can't kill the gospel because we've got God on our side. Why would God stop his story from spreading after he gave his son to die this horrible death on the cross. Why would God stop this? Nobody can stop God. And that's the most awesome thing when I prepared this sermon to realize, do you know what? God is on the move and you and I are part of his movement. 
because we committed ourselves to him, we say we believe in him, God says, then you are part of my movement and we are going to change the world because no one and nothing will prevent me from sharing the story of my son, Jesus Christ, with this world in need. And how is God doing it? Do you know he's doing it through you and me? He's doing it through you and me that comes to church every Sunday faithfully. If we can, we are here to show the world I belong to a God that's real. By reading our Bibles, by praying, by living differently, by acting nice and friendly to people around us, not because we are civil, but because we are godly. By making good choices and biblical choices in our relationships. So as the world look at us, we, they say to us, you guys are different in the way that you handle your life, your relationships, your sexuality, the way you handle your finances and each other at home. And we answer them by saying, do you know why? Because we believe in God. We believe in a God that has given us his, his guidelines, that has given us direction, has given us his gospel. A gospel that saves, a gospel that brings joy. We are changing the world by walking out of this place, even though our life is sometimes very hard, but by having a smile on our faces and say, God is good because I know that God is good, even though my life is not always great or good. But God is. And we can have the joy in us that Paul writes about, he says that the world can't understand. When everybody wants to run away, we stand. When everybody wants to dive underneath their beds, we stand. When everybody is so depressed that they don't want to live anymore, we say, we can live because in Christ it's possible. Because I know I'm owned by Him. I'm owned by Him. Satan, Antichrist, false prophet, Antioch, Epiphanes, all these guys in the Old Testament trying their best to destroy everything that has to do with the church. For ages and ages, countries, people, forces have tried to stop the gospel from spreading. Haven't done that well, have they? We live in a time where every single human on this planet now can hear the gospel. Through the internet. Through the internet. And I've heard that most remote communities now have access to the gospel. And that's what the Bible says. There will be a time when every tribe, person, nation will have access. And that time is now. God on the move like never before. And you are a part of that movement because we believe in a God that's going to complete His work in your life, in my life, and with His church. Amen.